the LHC is re it's really all about discovery uh, and, ex and exploration. We're looking for different kinds of things, new crazy kinds of things. I mean, to make up everyday matter, you only need the electron, the up quark, and the down quark. Because with yeast, with the up quark and the down quark, you can make a proton or you can make a neutron, right? Electrons and protons and neutrons, you can make any atom. So you only need these three. But there's, how many particles are there that we've discovered? Twelve? Why did we have them? I don't know. How many are there? A hundred? A million? Only twelve? We don't know. We're like looking at the tip of the iceberg here and wondering, is there a huge iceberg under the water or is this it? And what does it mean in either way, right? We're looking for patterns. It's just like the periodic table. You uh, take all the elements and you organize them by their characteristics and they fall into categories. And these guys over here tend to behave one way, these guys tend to behave another way. Why? Because there's a fundamental underlying structure. And now we know it's just electron orbitals around, around nuclei. So we have a periodic table of the fundamental particles and like the periodic table we've been putting it together and trying to organize it by the characteristics of the particles and it has some interesting features. It has patterns which suggest there must be some sort of underlying structure that we don't understand we haven't seen it yet. There's six quarks. Up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. These guys we call leptons. These are just names. There's an electron, muon, tau. And um, these guys interact with each other. These two interact with each other. These two interact with each other. Same way, these guys are paired with all these pairings. Is, is there more here? We don't know. What's the source of the patterns that we see in this table? We don't know. They're trying to figure out clues by figuring out what other kind of particles also exist. Like, what is out there? The thing is, we have this collider. And the magic of a collider is you can make kinds of matter in a collider that you don't have around. You can take two kinds of particles and annihilate them. And it's not like what comes out has to be a rearrangement of what went in. It's this quantum magic where it, it sort of disappears with pure energy and then you can make any sort of particle for which you have enough energy. It's like you have a menu. You go, you go to the restaurant, you have a menu, you're like, I have this much energy, so I can make anything that costs that much energy or less. So that's why you want to have as much energy as possible. And every time you crank up the energy, you could be exploring a whole new energy range, a whole new regime. It's like landing on a new planet, stock full of new particles nobody has ever seen, because nobody ever had the energy to make them. And as soon as we get over the threshold, boom, they just pop out. And so one of the things people predict is the Higgs boson. <laughs> the idea is that the Higgs boson is the particle that uh, is responsible for giving mass to the other particles. So you think of things that may have mass means it has stuff to it. It's not actually stuff. Earlier I was saying electron has mass, but has no volume. How can that be? Mm -hmm. Turns out mass is probably just a characteristic of a particle the way like charge is. Like some particles have charge, like electrons. Some particles don't. It's just a different kind of charge. So you can think of mass as sort of gravitational charge. And when two things have both have mass, they uh, attract each other. Right. Interestingly, you can't have negative mass or repulsive gravity. So gravity is different from other forces that way. The Higgs theory starts with this. Imagine a field that permeates the entire universe. And every particle uh, feels this field, is affected by this field, in different amounts. So some particles are really slowed down by interaction of this field, like you know swimming through molasses, and other particles hardly feel it. So the ones that hardly feel it they uh, have a small mass. The ones that are really affected by it, they couple strongly to this field, are slowed down a lot, they have large mass. So you've turned the question of why do particles have different masses into a different question. Why do particles feel the Higgs field differently? But there is one manifestation of the field is the existence of this particle. So there's lots of different reactions that could give you the Higgs. For example, one is you could have two gluons fuse give you a Higgs boson, and the Higgs could decay into two bottom quarks. The problem is, there's lots of other ways to make two bottom quarks. In fact, it's one of the most common things to make. You expect that to happen a million times more often um, from other kinds of processes than from the Higgs. The, the thing is, we can't see these reactions. We can't like watch them and slow them down, and reverse them. All we can do is see the reaction, the decay products from the reaction. So this part is all you see, and what you really want to know is, did this intermediate state exist? Right, so the collision happens, it lasts for like 10 to the negative 23 seconds, and you get one measurement, right? So if you say, well, I'm going to plot 
the mass, the total energy of this guy. I'm going to add this guy and this guy together and add the total energy. This is, uh, this axis here is number of collisions. You do an individual experiment, you get one measurement, right? Here. You do another one, you get another measurement. You do another one, eventually you build up your data, right? And the data looks like this, for example. And then you have two theories, right, that predict the data. One says, well, I'm going to predict there's no Higgs boson, so the data should fall along this line. And the other is I'm going to predict that plus a Higgs boson. And the problem is the difference between these two theories is very small. And so the, it's very hard to distinguish these two with our data because the predicted effect is tiny, right? If the predicted effect were huge, it'd be very easy to tell the difference between with Higgs boson or not with Higgs boson. But the predicted effect is tiny, and so it's really hard to see. What you need is a huge amount of data. You need to take a bajillion collisions before you can see the difference. That's why we run this thing 40 million times a second all day, all year, to get a lot of collisions to tell small differences between theories. It's like when you take a picture of the sky. You just take a picture, you get a little bit of light. The, the longer you leave your telescope looking at the sky, the, f the more you can see farther away things. There's lots of other things that make the Higgs. There's 10 other ways you can see the Higgs. There are people working on that one also. We work in a collaboration of thousands of people, and there's people working on every single channel. Some people are working on this one, some people are working on this one. And the idea is to try to look everywhere simultaneously to see a little bit of evidence here and a little bit of evidence there and a little bit of evidence here can be combined into convincing evidence. So we're going to leave it running for a long time and hope that, that something new pops out. There's still a possibility for a lot of new things. We've been running for a little while. We haven't seen anything crazy yet, but there could still be crazy pink elephants in there waiting to pop out. That's why I was saying earlier in lunch, like, any day somebody could say, oh, we well, see something exciting. Every time you open your email, like, that could be the time you heard about. Or every time your student makes a plot, like, what's in the data? What's in the data? It's exciting. <laughs>